spread out to all the Gentiles. What are Gentiles? Gentiles are non-Jews, anyone who is not a Jew. And Paul specifically addresses them in this context. And guess what? I'm a Gentile. I'm not a Jew. I didn't enter into that covenant relationship with God with the Ten Commandments. That wasn't for me. God chose a specific people to work through in order to reach the rest of the earth and bring the rest of the earth back into relationship. But I'm a Gentile. And I was without Christ. And what about without being without Christ? I was dead in my trespasses and sins, he tells us in chapter 2, 1. I'm doing a little bit of review here. You were dead in your trespasses and sins. Remember my zombie sermon, if you were here? We're all walking zombies. We look on the surface like we're alive. But inwardly, inwardly we're dead because we're not in Christ. We're not with God. We have no relationship with Him. By nature, we're children of wrath, it says in chapter 2, 3. That's our nature. Why? We're in Adam. What does Adam do? He turns his back on God. Basically lifts his fist. And most of mankind, that's what they do. We are children of wrath, act with wrath, We are destined to wrath because that is who we are and what we do. We're Gentiles in the flesh, and you know what that means. It means you haven't been circumcised. You haven't been set with a mark as a Gentile. Now, God puts a mark on our foreheads, those who trust in Christ, and we are sealed with the Spirit. He sees something there. It's it's almost like circumcision in a sense, only it's not physical. It's a spiritual marking. But before you accept Christ, this is where you are. You're Gentiles in the flesh. You're separated from Christ. The Jews lived in the covenant. All the Old Testament, as you study the Old Testament, you know what it's about? It's about Christ. The pictures of the temple, the pictures, all the things, all the symbolism that goes up. And I could go through and, and talk about the different people. Joseph, what a beautiful image of the Messiah. You know, right in Genesis. Noah, the sa- Savior of the world. Joseph is the Savior of the world. Uh, Joshua in Exodus, the savior of the nation. His name, Yahshua, his name, Yahshua, is the same name for Jesus. In fact, that's what the Jews were anticipating of the coming of Jesus would be another military Messiah, one who was going to save the nation. But God had a different program in mind. But we're separated from him. We have nothing to do with him. Alienated from the commonwealth of Israel. This is the political Israel, the national Israel. We don't have, we were not part of that. I wasn't a Jew. I couldn't participate in any of that. God had specifically selected them out for a function. And his work was being done through them. Paul is telling them all of this in Ephesians. You're strangers to the covenants and promise. You weren't under the covenant. You know why you're not a Jew. This is why I don't understand sometimes Christians, when they come to Christ, all of a sudden they think they've got to keep the law. The law wasn't made for you. The law and the covenant relationship and all the dietary regulations, all of that stuff was for the Jews. It was part of the covenant relationship that was written for them. You're strangers to that. And you didn't enter into the... You could do all those things, but you're not going to receive the promises that were made to the Jews because those were promises to the Jews if they kept the covenant. All the land promises. And everything else that went with it. And here's the biggie. Paul says, he finalizes this, you are without hope and you are without God. Huh? Well, they had their gods. We had our gods. We had our Zeus and our Jupiter. We had all the gods of the of the rest of the world. We had our Baals and our and all the the gods that you see coming into the Old Testament. We had those, but we didn't have God. We had no relationship with Him. And guess what? We were without hope. No hope. Wow. People don't like to hear that. The whole world is saved. There's many, many ways to salvation. Paul lays it out very clearly here. No, there's not. God decides the way to salvation. But you are now, if you have trusted in Jesus Christ as your Savior, you have entered into a mystery. Paul's going to tell us. Not right away. It's a big mystery. Why is it a mystery? Because... None of the prophets before quite understood it. No, there's hints of it in the Old Testament. They're there, but they didn't grasp it as the apostles grasped it and Jesus taught it. You enter into a mystery. You enter into Christ. You're not in Moses. You're in Christ. You've entered into something else, something wonderful. 
This term is so pregnant with meaning in Christ. The sphere. You're not in Adam. You're not, you're not in that camp anymore. You're in a new camp. You're in Christ's camp. But it's bigger than that. It's a spiritual camp. And it embodies everyone who has ever come to Christ. It embodies everyone in every nationality who has come to Christ. It's not about denominations, whether Baptist, Nazarene, Presbyterian, not about that. It's about those who know Christ. We Gentiles are brought near by the blood of Christ. We were far off. We weren't allowed into the temple. We weren't allowed into the covenants. There were proselytes, but even if you were a proselyte, one who came to Judaism, you couldn't enter into the temple. You had a place set aside for you, the court of the Gentiles. This is as close as you could get. But you're brought near by the blood of Christ. Ah, you're so far away before, but now you're close. You see what God's doing? He's breaking down all the walls. He's allowing us to enter into something that we weren't a part of. Christ is our peace, we're told. Our peace. Because remember, we were children of wrath. We were destined to wrath. No longer. In Christ, we have peace. No wrath ahead for us. It's not of our doing. It's of Christ's doing. He did it all. You know, on the cross it says, It is finished. I read something on the internet the other day about easy believism. Believing is not easy. There's nothing easy about believing that Jesus died for your sins. That's easy. I struggled for months and months reading through the whole Bible just about before I came to Christ because it wasn't an easy thing to believe. But then I believed. It's not easy, but that's all I do is believe. It's not an act of work. It's an act of trust. Trust that Jesus Christ did it. Trust? Trust is a hard thing. I have times trouble trusting my wife or trusting my family or trusting the congregation or trusting people get things done. Trust isn't easy. Put your trust in Christ. And some of you say, I have trouble trusting. Yeah, you have trouble trusting. But that's really what it's all about. That's about what our whole faith, that's what faith means. That's what belief means. It's about trusting. It's about a relationship and believing he's in control. He's going to work it out for you. Christ is our peace. The dividing wall between Jew and Gentile has been destroyed, creating one new man. I don't, okay, I'm a Gentile. Here's the Jews over here. Oh, I so much want to be like the Jews and be in the covenant. Even if I grasp that, I'm not really allowed into that. There's this giant wall here. I'm a Gentile. Number one, number one I don't want to get, as a man, get circumcised. That's a big requirement to get into that. I don't want that camp. That hurts, you know. But God says, no, 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 no. You don't have to enter that camp anymore. In fact, you know what? I'm tearing down that wall. Crumble. Gone. You know what? Jews don't become Gentiles. Gentiles don't become Jews. What you do, you're one new man. You are in Christ. It's a whole different thing. And it's the same requirement for the Jew and for the Gentile. Many make a big mistake of thinking, I'm a Gentile. If I'm going to enter into Christ, I've got to go through being a Jew first. No, you don't. No, you don't. It's all in Christ. It's complete in Him. The dividing wall is broken down. Do you see the... You've got this wall. You've got Jew, Gentile. There's this wall between them. There's still a wall between Jews and Gentiles in the world. You still have Jews. You still have Gentiles. And you have those who are in Christ. And most attentions in the world right now are between Jews and Gentiles. There's a huge wall right there. Being in Christ, we ought to be the reconcilers between them. By bringing people into that, there should be no more alienation between Jew and Gentile because Jew and Gentile who enter into Christ are one body. They're in Christ. Are are you getting the picture there? The beauty of it? This is the same problem that Paul had. He reaches out and brings the Jews in, gets them in Christ. He's a Jew. All the Jews hate him. Because they're not in Christ. No, they're not celebrating the law. He says, you don't have to be in the law. In fact, you Jew, you have to be in Christ. You Gentile, you have to be in Christ. And if you're in Christ, 
You're a new creature. You're in one body. You're in one building. Well, the Jews don't like that. Gentiles don't like it. They still don't like the Jews. What do they do? They go to Jerusalem and destroy the temple. Beautiful thing, that destruction of the temple. Because now all of a sudden the picture is, that's not really the temple. In Christ, there's a whole new temple. We're going to talk about that. You're the temple. Jew and Gentiles are reconciled into one body through the cross. One body. Notice you've got a building analogy, you've got a body analogy. We're going to look at this. This beautiful reconciliation that's going on. Christ has killed the hostility between Jew and Gentile. In Christ, not in the world, the hostility is still going on. It will tend, continue to go on. The only way to discontinue the hostility is to bring people to Christ. Both Jew and Gentile. And in Christ there is no hostility. We're of one body. Both Jew and Gentiles through one spirit have access to the Father. The only ones who had access to the Father before were the Jews. And then it wasn't an indwelling. It was whenever God so desired to give them the Spirit through prophecy or whatever. But you know what? Now we have access through the Spirit to the Father. Jews have access to the Spirit. But all only if you're in Christ. Because Christ is the one that sends the Comforter, the Paraclete, the Holy Spirit. He dwells within the congregation and all Christianity in a corporal sense, but also within the individual. We have access to the Father. I suggest you use pray, pray, pray. That's your access to the Father. Pray. We need to be a praying church. Prayer is hard. You know why prayer is hard? It's spiritual warfare. Every time you try to go to the Father, someone's going to try to stop you from going to the Father because that's where your power is. That's my biggest warfare in my Christian life. We who are once called Gentiles are no longer strangers and aliens. I'm not one way out there anymore. I have access to the Father. Do I enter into the inner court of the temple? There is no inner court of the temple. You know why? Because the inner court of the temple is right here. It's right here. He's indwelling us, not some building. We are the building. Paul goes on and he builds on this. We who are in Christ, Jew and Gentiles together, are one building. Our fellow citizens and the household of God. Wow. Oh, wow. Fellow citizens and the household of God. Wish I could feel it. It's easier to go to church and feel a building and walk in or a temple where everybody comes to the temple. But this is a spiritual temple. You can't see it physically. It's not, you walk in this church, the church isn't this building. I don't care where we meet. It's the people of God. One body, our fellow heirs, members of the same body, partakers of the promise. We're going to look at both of these. These are metaphors. They're, they're figures of speech, Paul uses, the building and the body to try to bring home to the Gentiles what Christ has done for them. This book of Ephesians is written predominantly to the Gentiles to show they're no longer alienated. I'm no longer alienated. Wow. God has reconciled me. He has brought me to himself. God is building a home for himself. God is building, God is a bodybuilder. <laughs> I, I try to pick some pictures to put up here, but I didn't, you know. <laughs> Let's look at the passage and see the first part is on the building of his home. Ephesians 2.19, and we're going to look at 3.6 on the building of the body. So then you who are no longer strangers, he's talking to the Gentiles and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Not only citizens, you're part of the family. You, you see what he's saying here? How beautiful. You're built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. Yeah, he's building a building. you got the apostles, you got the prophets, probably talking about New Testament prophets, or anything else, but they're the foundation. But you're being built into that. Christ Jesus himself is a cornerstone in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple with the Lord. Here you got the temple analogy. you got the building analogy. you got, it's growing. It's not complete. It's not finished. It's still in process. It's still under construction. In Him you also are being built together into a dwelling place 
for God by the Spirit. Let's break this down a little bit. Well, let me go ahead and read the bodybuilder portion. For this reason, I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, on behalf of you Gentiles. He is the apostle to the Gentiles. He's one of those building blocks in the foundation. Assuming that you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me, he has how the mystery was made known to me by revelation as I have written briefly when you read this you can perceive my read this you can perceive my insight into the mystery do you like secrets that's what he's talking about it's a secret it's a mystery which was not made known to the sons of men and other generations as it was now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the spirit This mystery, the secret, is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs. They're members of the same body and partakers of the promise of Christ Jesus through the gospel. Oh, I'm so glad. Let's look at this mystery of the building first. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, you Gentiles, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. He's talking to the non-Jews. You're no longer strangers. You're no longer aliens. Notice one of the key things in... In Judaism, any time the prophets are speaking, whether it be Jeremiah or Isaiah or any of them, the condemnation usually is it has to do with keeping the law. You haven't taken care of the orphans. You haven't taken care of the widows. And you haven't taken care of the aliens. Aliens were those, those strangers who came in and wanted to be a part of Israel, couldn't participate completely in everything, but they were brought in, and they've always been a part of Israel. When you read the story about Ruth and Naomi, you know, David is a descendant of Ruth. She was a Moabite. They were the enemies of the Jews. And you've got these things constantly in the Scriptures where individuals are brought into the body and become full partakers, but you're not an alien anymore. Believing Gentiles are fellow citizens. We're, we're, we're part of God's kingdom, a new kingdom he's developed. And we're part of it. We have a political part in it. But not only that, we're part of his family. We're members of the household of God. It might be by adoption, but we're still by, through Christ, part of a family. I hope y'all grasp this. I hope you understand. You know, I don't like so much to be called, hey, Brother Turner, you know, whatever. <laughs> and, and there's a brother in church, you know, they, they really build on that or whatever. But we are brothers. We're brothers and sisters in Christ, we are a family. And I hope for many of you, you feel closer to people within your own family of believers, possibly, than your actual physical family. I do. You know, I love my family. But I really feel closer, in many ways, to, to my Christian family. And I've got family all over the world. I've got them in every nation, because I've known so many missionaries. I've got them in every state, just about. I can go anywhere and I can find... And you know what? I can walk in to a church and I have a family member I never met before. Why do I have to do all the genealogies tracing my family? They're all over the place. You know, just walk in and find them. And some family members are tough to get along with at times. But, you know, still. Built on a foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. It's not a physical temple And I think God had a reason for allowing the temple to go down. Remember the Samaritan woman? She goes to him, well, we we worship in these hills. And Jesus says, well, you know, the Jews worship in Jerusalem at the temple. You worship up in these hills. But there will be a time where true worshipers will worship me in spirit and in truth. About 40 years later, the temple goes down. There is no physical temple. And instead, it's the entire church is the temple. And the foundation is built upon the apostles. The apostles are the ones who receive the revelation. The New Testament prophets also receive a revelation as well. It was important, especially in the New Testament, at, at the beginning stages of these individuals prophesying. It's a spiritual temple with foundations, apostles, and prophets, with Jesus Christ as the cornerstone. I get the same analogy almost as the branch and the branches. I am the branch. You are the branches. We are the twigs that go out of the branches. <laughs> but it's a tree. It's a metaphor. But I hope you grasp the picture of it all. That you are a component of it. You're an important component of it. You're one of the stones in this temple, in this spiritual temple. And God ain't finished with it yet. That's the beauty of it. 
in whom the whole structure being joined together grows. Notice this grows. It's in progress. It's not done. Into a holy temple in the Lord. It's growing. It's holy. What's holy mean? It's separated. In Christ, it's not the Jews. It's not the Gentiles. It is holy. It is separate from all. It is in God. When we're talking about holiness, we're not just talking about purity, although that's involved in it. It's the same word as saint or sanctified. It means set apart. You're different. It's different from the physical temple. It's a different kind of a temple. But what is a temple? A temple place is a dwelling spot of God. That's where the temple, the Holy of Holies, is where God made himself known, was present. It's holy. It's in the Lord. It's in Christ Jesus. Oh, man, I, I get so excited over this. I wish I could visualize it better. I wish it wasn't so abstract. He's trying to bring it into concrete forms with metaphors and all. But you really still can't grasp it completely, what it's all about. In Him you also, you also, are being built together into the dwelling place for God by the Spirit. You're one of the blocks. You're one of the bricks. You're the cornerstone. You're not an apostle. You're not a prophet. But you're a brick in it. And it's been laid. Notice what it says. The dwelling place. Believing Jews into this dwelling. But the dwelling place is not a building. God's people are the building. It's the dwelling place for God by the Spirit. Do you feel the Spirit? I don't feel the Spirit. Sometimes when I'm reading my Bible and I'm studying, I'm re reading through Ephesians, I grasp this, I just start to go into awe. I sense the work of the Spirit. Do I walk around all the time and feel the Spirit? No. I wish I did. I like to feel the Spirit all the time. It's not a question of feeling Him. It's a question of objectively just being there. He's there. If you've trusted Christ as your Savior, the Spirit is there. You've been marked by the Spirit. You've been sealed by the Spirit. You're indwelt by the Spirit. You might not always be filled by the Spirit in the sense that you sense His pouring out through you, but He's there. Sometimes we grieve the Spirit, and when we grieve the Spirit, all of a sudden we don't sense His presence, but He's still there. You're under construction. The whole building's under construction. Each piece is under construction. I'm under construction. That's why, you know what? We need to be patient with one another because God is building in each one of you a little different than He is everybody else. And whatever He's doing with you to make you an important part of the brick, an important part of that foundation, is a little bit different from what He's doing with somebody else. And He doesn't deal with anybody in the same way. Just like you've had children, you know that you're, none of your kids are the same. You're, you're the same way. But there's also this mystery of the body. For this reason, I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ, on behalf of you Gentiles, what am I? I'm the apostle of the Gentiles. God has given this to me. I'm bringing you the mess. It's not that the other apostles didn't receive this. Peter received it. The blanket came down, you know, and it's filled with all kinds of animals. God says, eat. And Peter says, whoa, wait a second. I'm a Jew. He said, there is no more a Jew. There's no more a Gentile. Eat. Eat. Why do you eat? And all of a sudden the other apostles come running to him. What in the world are you doing? He said, God told me to do this. He revealed it to me. He said, oh, okay. Wasn't quite that simple, you know. They had to go to a council in Jerusalem with all the apostles. Can you imagine what must have gone through their head with this? Is this guy apostate? But God began to reveal it to them as well, that this is the way it works. The Gentiles are included, and God has chosen Paul to be the primary messenger to the Gentiles. He's a Jew of Jews. I don't understand that. He seemed like the perfect person to be reaching all the Jews. But he's not. He's the one God chooses for us. Paul, prisoner for Jesus Christ. You know what? Every one of you is a prisoner. We're all prisoners. We're all servants. We, we won't. I'm not a servant to anybody. Yes, you are. You're a servant to sin. If you're not in Christ... Some of you are servants to pornography. You can't get out of it. You have no control over it. You just find yourself in it all the time. You're under the domain and you're under servanthood. Some of you are under some kind of, you know, I'm a, I'm a servant to caffeine. I was thinking the other day, I've got to quit the caffeine. 
I start trying to quit the caffeine. I don't know that I can quit the caffeine. My coffee is my most pleasant part of the day, even though it sends me up in the air for the day. But I am going to, I am a servant to caffeine. And if I don't get control of it, I got to quit drinking my six to seven cups a day and go down to two, if nothing else. I'm a servant to the bathroom because I drink too many the coffee. <laughs> I'm running to the bathroom all day long. <laughs> so, why? I'm a prisoner for Christ on behalf of you Gentiles. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm his servant. He's called me. I've accepted the calling and I am going to do it. I'm a prisoner as a pastor in a sense. There's many things I hate about being a pastor. I don't, there's lots of things I don't like. But God called me to be a pastor. I'm a pastor. And I will continue to be a pastor because God has told me to be a pastor. How does he tell me? Do I hear a voice? No. He just kind of put me there and I know it's where he wants me. So you do what God calls you to do. If you don't, you're doing what, you know, you're running away from his calling. The steward of the gospel of grace for the giant. You know what a steward is? You know, you hire a steward to handle your finances or your affairs to your house or whatever. God, Paul is a steward. He's been given. The Jews were a steward of the revelation of God. They're stewards of the covenant. He is a steward of the gospel of Christ to the Gentiles. It's an administration, a caretaker. He's got to protect it. He's got to watch over it. He's got to distribute it accordingly. If, if someone gives me a stewardship over a, a large sum of money and asks me to distribute it to the poor, then I have to administrate and do it in an adequate way, not pillage from it or anything else, but do it as that individual has told me to do it. How the mystery was made known to me by revelation, as I have written briefly. How was this mystery? God told him. I don't know about you, God don't tell me much. I get my revelation from Paul. <laughs> I get it second hand. He gave it to Paul, I get it from Paul. He has a couple of times I've had some messages I've pretty well thought maybe were. God talked to me. But it wasn't a broad sense to everybody. It was just a specific thing to me. When you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ, a secret that he's given me, which was made known to the sons of men in other generations as it has been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets now. We receive, it's a mystery. Do you like secrets? No, Kerry says. I don't want to hear the gossip. I don't want to hear the gossip. But you do like to know something that others don't know that is good. A good message. Did you hear the secret? Most of us, I like a good mystery story. You like to be a good mystery story? You know, you, you, you listen to these mystery stories or go read these mystery stories and you're waiting to the end to see what, what is the thing that is going to be revealed to us that we didn't know. This is kind of what's happening here. It's a mystery. It's a secret. The whole Testament, the Jews didn't, wasn't told to them even though they had revelation. It was not available in the previous generations to the Jews. It has now been revealed to the apostles, the New Testament prophets by the Spirit. Jesus came, and what he did wasn't just for the Jews, it was for all of us. It wasn't adequate for a specific group of people. It was adequate for Africans, Asians, Europeans, Americans, Indonesians, you, you name it. It was adequate for all. Sufficient for all. The blood of Christ is bigger than the covenant of law to the Jews. This mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, member of the same body, and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. What's this mystery? You're now an heir. You know, the Jews, in following the law, what did they get? They had promise of prosperity in the land. They had promises about the Messiah and the fulfillment of the Messiah and the coming kingdom and all those type things. Now, you don't get the promises to the land, the physical aspect of it, but you have the promise of another kingdom, a greater kingdom. You have the promises, all the promises that you, of the new Jerusalem, all the promises of the relationship that God is rest, restoring. All the walls are broken down, reconciliation. God is in the business of reconciliation. Members together with believing Jews in the same body, the body of Christ, partakers of the promise in Christ. You can't have it any other way. 
There is no other way. If you're not in Christ, you're either of the Jews or you're of the Gentiles and you're outside. And all this thing, there's got to be other ways. No, God said there's one way. It's through my Son, my only begotten Son. And if you trust in Him, you enter into Him and you get all these promises through the gospel, the good news, the body of Christ. This is a mystery. He tells us his mystery. He's going to tell us later even in Ephesians. He relates the family to this and says it's a mystery. What is the good news? Christ died for all. He died for the Jews. He died for the non-Jew. That all may come to him. So simple. Is it easy? Easy to believe this? I don't think so. To the Gentiles it's foolishness. The Jews are looking for signs. Rationally, to many, if you're not reading the scriptures and don't begin to grasp the reasoning and rationality of God, men's reasons, it doesn't make sense that one could die for our sins. That if you go to the cross and look at him, that the sins of the world are upon him and that he died for us. Why? For the purpose of reconciliation. And you know what he's calling us to be? God is the God of reconciliation. Christ is the Christ of reconciliation. And he wants to be you the children of reconciliation. He wants you to work at reconciling people to God and he wants you to help reconcile people to people. Jews to Gentiles, but also people to people. And it starts with you in your own heart. You've got to work on this. You've got to give it to Christ. God, Jesus, you died for my sins. I, I didn't like you. I had nothing to do with you. Will you reconcile yourself or reconcile others? Reconcile yourself first to God by trusting in Jesus Christ. And then begin working on the other forms of reconciliation. Will you do that today?